a large village sprawled along the bank of a swift river which separated it from civilization. Crossing the river by foot was impossible, the current was too strong. Carol sat on the veranda. A throbbing headache pulsed in her temples, striking over and over. She leaned back in her chair, thinking that today was off to a horrible start. Just like every day in this village, she hated this village. She would give anything to return to city life. They had lived well in the city, not rich, but able to pay the bills, take care of the children, and even save a little. The woman wearily closed her eyes. The headache seemed to explode in vivid colors in her head, pressing on her eyes and temples. She felt as if the pressure was about to split her skull. Every morning here she suffered from these headaches. She was in a constant state of nervous tension and didn't know how to escape this nightmare. And it all happened because of her husband. He had taken out a loan without telling her, started a business and failed completely, ending up in massive debt. Carol only found out when he presented her with the facts. She had to sell her business, sell their apartment to pay off the debts, and avoid ending up on the street. In a hurry, literally packing on the run, the woman, her husband, and their child moved to the village, where they now lived in her parents' old house. Mum, can I go play? asked the boy, holding an inflated orange ball. The kids are here. We want to have a basketball tournament. Sure, bring me some water and the green pill from the table. Then you can go play. Just come back before the rain, said the woman, pointing to the dark clouds gathering. She wasn't just warning about the rain, she was hoping for it. On days when her head hurt so badly, only the rain could provide relief from the heat. The boy brought her a glass of water and the pill and went to the gate. He waved to his mother and left, leaving her alone. A grey tabby cat jumped onto her lap and purred. He looked at her, rubbing against her thin nose. The woman said, Yes, Lucky, you're the only joy in this cursed village. She sat like that for another hour before the headache began to subside. She went into the house and started cleaning and cooking. Carol missed her city apartment, the comfort, and the simplicity of that life. She hated the rural way of life. They had moved here temporarily, but nothing is more permanent than temporary. She looked out the window at the approaching clouds. The gate opened, and an old car drove into the yard. They used to have a luxurious car. The woman wistfully remembered her favorite vehicle. She got up and went out to the porch to meet her husband. He was carrying a bag of groceries. His mood was clearly foul. He muttered irritably to himself, passing by his wife as if not noticing her. Carol more and more often thought she should have filed for divorce long ago and kicked this idler out of her life. But she didn't want her son to grow up without a father, as she once did. On the other hand, this life wasn't good for the boy either. Carol flinched. A blinding lightning bolt split the sky and struck the ground. In the distance, after a few seconds, came a faint rumble of thunder. Carol, close all the windows in the barn, take everything in from the yard, there's a storm warning on the radio, shouted the neighbor, Laura, over the gusting wind. Carol shouted her thanks. She quickly put away all the tools from the yard, closed the barn and windows. She even went up to the attic to close the large round window with the old stained glass. This stained glass was the only thing she liked about this house, where her mother had been unhappy first with Carol's father, then with two other husbands. Carol fetched her son from outside, and they went into the house together. The wind was getting stronger, the time between lightning and thunder growing shorter. It was strange that the storm warning had come so late this time. Mother and son went inside and immediately washed their hands. They went to the kitchen, where her disgruntled husband was already sitting. He clicked his tongue, tapping his fingers on the wooden table. Carol didn't intend to react to his displeasure, but she felt that she would soon lose her temper. They sat down to eat. 
Suddenly there was a tremendous crash, and the windows rattled. The boy jumped in surprise. Right after the crash, the downpour began. It was clear that the husband was very angry. While driving home, he had worked himself up again, and now everyone around him had to suffer from his bad mood. Carol looked at him. She couldn't stand it when he got angry like this, but the man said angrily, Couldn't your parents have settled closer to the city? Now we have to sit here and do nothing. You could at least show some respect for the memory of my parents. If it weren't for their house, we'd be out on the street. Isn't it because of you that we lost everything? You create problems and complain, and we have to listen to it. Why don't you man up, pull yourself together, and start doing something? It's your fault we're left with nothing and huge debts. You're the reason we have to live in this village now. So deal with it yourself, Carol said calmly but firmly. She pushed her plate away. Her head was starting to ache in, and she lost her appetite. Another deafening clap of thunder sounded, and a cracking noise indicated that some tree had fallen under the force of the wind. The boy stood up, thanked his mother for lunch, and went to his room. He was afraid to be alone in such weather, but he didn't want to listen to his parents' quarrel either. The man cast an angry glance at the boy but said nothing. He just rolled his eyes and stuffed a piece of bread into his mouth. Carol looked at her husband. She was tired of all this. He earned nothing, depended on her, and only caused her stress. You know, Ralph, let's separate and get divorced. I'm tired of listening to your complaints. I sold my apartment and car for you, even sold my business so that my child and I wouldn't be harmed, and all because you got involved with some shady company. Now, everything you earn goes to booze and cigarettes to your entertainment while I'm still the one supporting the family. Yet you still manage to yell at me every day and even get physical. I've had enough. Pack your things and leave tomorrow, Carol said calmly. He suddenly stared at her as if she had uttered some magical forbidden word. Ralph glanced around, then stared at his wife again but suddenly his disturbed face became angry and wild again. What are you trying to scare me, you fool? Do you think I'll start jumping at your command? You won't get anywhere with this. The man punched the table, jumped up, and began packing his things. He threw item after item into the suitcase, crammed everything in tightly, grabbed his jacket, and stormed out. The man got into his car and drove off. It had been a horribly difficult and exhausting day. She needed a brief respite, a minimal rest. Mom, did Dad leave the boy asked, approaching his mother. Don't be upset. He doesn't love you anyway. Actually, he doesn't love either of us. Why do you think so? The woman asked, looking into the boy's large grey eyes framed with thick lashes. She hadn't suspected that such thoughts were running through his mind. She knew her husband had never shown any love or care for their son, but she didn't realize it was so obvious to the boy. I've seen how other parents treat their kids. You love me, but Dad doesn't. And it shows. The main thing is we have a man in the house, and that's me, the boy said proudly. He hugged his mother, who almost burst into tears from his touching words. Will we go back to the city now, the boy asked, not knowing how hard it would be for them. I don't know. I have a small salary and I'll try to take more shifts, but I don't think it's possible right now. Maybe in a year or a couple of years we'll be able to go back. Are you tired of living in the village? Of course I am. Just look at what's happening outside. Find some candles in the kitchen cupboards because we'll definitely lose power if the wires go down. And the black copper flashlight, I think it was in your room, the woman said, stroking her son's head. The boy nodded and left. Carol lay down and closed her eyes. She hadn't felt this good in a long time. Now that her husband was gone, she seemed to be softer towards the house, 
the whims of the weather, and the village itself, she reached for a book and started reading. She felt as if she was filling up with strength and energy again, and her headache subsided, giving way to clarity and calm. If someone had told Carol a couple of years ago that she would calmly accept the upcoming divorce, she wouldn't have believed it. She heard her son shout. Mom, the water is up to the first step, the boy said. I heard the cats and let them in. It was evident from the boy's demeanor that he was very anxious. This was the first serious flood he could remember. He was scared, or maybe he just didn't know what to do next. This house has survived many such floods. My father built it smartly. The water won't go beyond the second step the main flow will head into the forest. It's much lower than us. It'll wash everything away and make a great playfield for you. Remember when we first moved here? The boys showed you how the silt had settled in the forest? We arrived right after a flood. It's not uncommon here in the summer. Several days had passed since her husband left. Carol felt happier and freer with each passing day. She even arranged to take on new shifts, planning her upcoming move, thinking about how to find a new job in the city and start fresh. Carol reached the hair salon where she worked and soon stood in front of the mirror. When she first moved, she didn't know what services would be in demand outside the city, but the village was large and many people were interested. When Carol offered to rent a booth, the salon owner was glad for the extra income. She suddenly froze when her son entered the salon. Mom, can we go to the forest with friends? I finished my homework, I promise. We're going to have a war, the boy asked excitedly, approaching his mother and looking at her with big eyes, as if pleading for permission. He loved playing war in the forest because it was like his favorite computer games only in real life. Go ahead, but only up to the red flags. Mr. Black said he put new ones up this morning, so no going into the thicket. Thanks, Mum, he gave her a quick kiss and ran off. Joyful shouts could be heard outside, apparently. The whole group of kids was gathering to play war. There were boys and girls, even teenagers. After the flood, the children often went to the forest because it created a kind of futuristic landscape silt settled in strange stripes and swirls, forming drifts and debris. The kids set up a real war. They divided into teams and started making weapons out of sticks. It turned into a battle scene that even Hollywood action movie fans would appreciate. The skirmishes lasted several hours, but eventually everyone started to leave. The children were tired from running through the silt, which soon became sticky again. Clouds began to cover the sky once more. Only Sammy and his friends were left in the forest. While playing, the children stumbled upon a coffin. They looked at the old wooden coffin, unlike modern ones. They exchanged glances but hesitated to open it. What if it's not a coffin at all? One of the children said. Maybe there are treasures inside. Let's open it and see. But what if it's cursed, said another boy. What if we open it and something bites us? A heated argument broke out. The children couldn't decide what to do next, but curiosity proved stronger than their survival instinct. One of the boys took a long stick, wedged it under the lid, and pried open the coffin, which had been brought to the forest by the silt. As they opened it, the kids froze in shock, but within seconds they screamed and ran away. Only Sammy remained, not understanding why he wasn't scared. He approached the coffin and knelt before the skeleton. In its clenched hand, adorned with large gold rings, was a crumpled piece of cellophane or something similar. The boy pulled the package from the hand and found a note inside. Dear Margaret, I miss you. I miss your touch and your gaze, your hands and your kisses. Forgive me my sins. Forgive me for being old-fashioned and writing you a letter instead of calling like normal people do. I'll be back soon and will be by your side. 
This is my last trip. The letter was quite long. The boy folded it back and put it in the package. He closed the coffin lid and went home. He was so bewildered that he didn't know what to say. But then a thought struck him. He knew the author of the letter. The boy walked towards a large, unfamiliar mansion. Soon his pace quickened. Before long, Sammy was running towards the house that stood out from the others. He knocked on the gate and a round-faced guard opened it. The guard smirked but stepped aside when he heard the voice of his boss. What do you want, boy? asked a thin man. I have a letter for you, the boy shouted. The man froze instantly at his cry. He suddenly turned and walked towards him, furrowing his brows. It seemed he thought it was some kind of silly joke, but the boy wasn't joking. He handed over a package that looked like a strange plastic envelope. The man took the letter and almost fainted. Who opened it? He looked from the boy to the letter and then to the guard. Boy, where did you get this? Don't you dare lie to me. Where did you get this? Mr. Clark repeated in a trembling voice. He looked at the boy with crazed eyes, as if hope had been reborn in his soul. But even at his young age, the boy understood that he was about to break the man's heart. We were playing in the forest and stumbled upon a coffin. We thought it was a treasure chest. We opened it, and there was a skeleton inside. The letter was in the skeleton's hands. If you want, I can show you where the chest is. But you have to take me home afterwards. It's getting dark, and the way from the forest to the village isn't short, and you can't see anything in the dark, the boy quickly said. The man immediately got into the car, seated the boy, and took another guard with him. They reached the edge of the forest in a matter of minutes, just as dusk was falling. Sammy led the anxious thin rich man to the exact spot and left him alone. The man fell to his knees and began to sob, waving the guard away. The guard took the boy back to the car and drove him home. Mr. Clark sat by the coffin, only hearing the heavy beats of his heart pounding in a rhythm of sorrow and anxiety. Memories of her gentle laughter, soft touches, and tender voice haunted him, causing agonizing pain. He recalled how she loved walks in the garden, her smile when they had breakfast on the terrace together, her care and support during difficult times. He berated himself for not being able to protect her, for allowing the enemies to deal this cruel blow. Horrible images flashed in his mind, and he couldn't shake off the thoughts of how much she must have suffered. Sammy stood by the fence, watching the car drive away, not fully understanding what was happening. Sammy, come inside already. You've stayed out too late, his mother shouted, poking her head out. Let's have dinner before everything gets cold. She went back into the house and headed to the kitchen to cut the salad. The boy went in and took a shower to wash off the forest dirt. He returned to his mother and clumsily told her everything that had happened in the forest today. Carol was so shocked that for a while she couldn't say anything. She just looked at her son, not believing that children could do such things at that age. I don't approve of you opening that chest, but I'm very glad you helped Mr. Clark. I've known him since childhood and remember his wife. I guess that's her lying there. She always wore a ring with a turquoise stone. She was a good woman, beautiful. She disappeared, and he mourned for a long time, kept searching and searching, and now she was washed out from the bottom. The woman pondered, and the son listened. He had never heard this story before. He absorbed his mother's words. It felt like he was inside some book with a twisted plot. He brought her from France. She didn't even speak English at first and was always learning the language. I remember my mother would go to her and help her with the language. She started speaking fairly quickly and understanding even faster. She was a beautiful girl with an unusual appearance. Mr. Clark was always busy with work and she was left alone. 
One time he came home and she wasn't there. They said it was Mr. Clark's rivals or enemies who kidnapped her. More than ten years have passed, and only now they met again, the woman said sadly. She reflected on the fact that true love exists not only in books, even with such a sad ending. One evening, a few days later, she and her son were sitting in the living room. The woman was reading a book, and the son was drawing. The television was on in the background with some adventure film. They chatted and joked, but then both froze when there was a knock. Carol got up and opened the door. The same thin man entered the house holding some kind of bag. He suddenly turned to the boy and bowed to him, as if it was a sign of gratitude. Come in. I'll make you some coffee, Carol said, delighted to see an old friend. Carol, you've become so beautiful. I didn't know he was your son. I locked myself in my mansion and haven't really seen people. He probably told you what he found in the forest. Everything has been checked. It's Louisa, my Louisa. I can't believe it happened this way. I searched for so many years and she was in the river all this time. Or maybe she was washed out from underground. She always carried that letter with her, apparently holding it before she died. It's hard on the soul, Carol, terribly hard. But I won't have any coffee. I came to say goodbye and thank your son for his help, the man hesitated as if searching for words, but continued a few seconds later, I'm leaving forever. There's nothing left for me here. And this is for you, as a token of gratitude for everything. He said goodbye to them, left his bag and walked out of the house. The mother and son escorted the man to the gate. He got into his car, waved to them, and smiled. Carol went back into the house with Sammy. She thought that the bag probably contained books, old records, or some keepsakes, but when she opened it, she was stunned. It was stuffed with large bills. She even swallowed hard, unable to fathom having such a huge amount of money in their possession. The boy kept glancing between his mother and the money, and then back at his mother. She sat on the floor in front of the bag full of money and looked at her son. A year had passed since the man left a huge sum of money as a reward for the woman and her son. They hadn't seen him since, but they managed to turn their lives around. Carol finally sold her parents' house and deposited all the money into a bank account. She bought a house in the city and enrolled her son in a prestigious school. The money would have been enough to last her a lifetime, but she didn't sit idle. She opened her own cafe featuring natural desserts. She enjoyed running the place, seeing delighted customers, and simply doing what she loved. Sometimes she would sit in her office and reflect on how much life can change in just one evening. Just a year ago, they were barely making ends meet, and now they could live without needing anything. She even saw her ex-husband once with his new wife and child. He had come to the village. Carol looked so beautiful, well-groomed, and was driving a brand new car. This bothered her ex-husband, who couldn't hide his envy and irritation. When he left, he had said she would regret it, but in reality, things turned out quite differently. Thank you for listening to the story till the end. Please support the channel with a like. It won't take much effort, but it means a lot to me. See you next time.